I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Dasgupta. As millions of children return for the new school year, this is an episode about the hazards of walking to school. Reducing vehicular transport reduces carbon emissions, obviates the need for bus drivers who are in short supply right now, and gaggles of walking and biking children make communities come alive. Yet most students in Montgomery County Public Schools and in most suburban counties take the bus, drive, or are driven to school. MCPS runs one of the largest bus services in the state of Maryland with 1,400 buses, which is certainly larger than the county's own ride-on bus service. Recently, the Montgomery County Planning Department released its proposed pedestrian master plan, which made the case that reducing the hazards of walking to school via school siding, design, and infrastructure development could encourage more families to allow their children to walk and bike to school and for the school system to reduce its busing obligations. I spoke with the master plan's lead author, Eli Glazer, and the planning department's chair, Casey Anderson about the current state of affairs and what can be done about the hazard of walking to school. Oh, had I a golden thread and needle I'd weave a magic band of rainbow design, of rainbow design. In it I would weave the bravery of women. If you're new to the show, I Hate Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and our local governments, as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are messy, dirty, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians. But no matter how much we may hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society functioning precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. It is my hope that this podcast will help those who feel left out reconnect in our local communities. Music for this episode comes from Montgomery County Climate Band, The Sunshiners, Kippen Martin on guitar and vocals, Rick Sullivan on vocals and guitar, and Jeffrey Wisner on the double bass. They released their first album, Endangered Species, on the podcast on Earth Day 2022. In the news this week, teacher and staff and bus driver shortages persist, but it is unclear what the real numbers are. Shortage is a relative term of need, which can be defined in various ways. One reason the shortage numbers rose over the summer is because the federal COVID response money led to the creation of new positions. And one reason the numbers appear to have gone down, at least for MCPS now, is how schools have developed plans to merge and consolidate unfilled positions. 
A measure of the dire straits MCPS finds itself in became visible last week in an email that offered dual certified teachers $5,000 to move to a special education position from their current non-special education position. The staff shortage is most acute in special ed. It is unclear how many dual certified teachers responded positively to the $5,000 offer. Already, National Board Certified Teachers are supposed to get $10,000 more and National Board Certified Teachers choosing to teach in identified high-need schools get another 7000 in Maryland. The state of Maryland has long been a net importer of teachers, particularly from neighboring Pennsylvania. But even that pipeline has been dwindling. The shortage of teachers affects staff diversity goals most school districts, including MCPS, have. Why should a smart black, brown, or Asian young person consider a career in a field that is continually beat upon? We did an episode recently examining Maryland's efforts to deal with the teacher shortage with Cheryl Bost, president of the Statewide Teachers Union, the Maryland State Education Association. More MCPS news. Courts dismissed a lawsuit from parents demanding teachers reveal in-school gender choices to families against the wishes of students. The rise of far-right, anti-gender, anti-history, anti-books, anti-masking, anti-vaccine politics have arrived in Maryland. In neighboring Frederick, the local Trump-supporting delegate, Dan Cox, won the Republican gubernatorial nomination in an upset victory, which led the state's Republican governor, Larry Hogan, to say that he would support the Democratic nominee instead. Despite the fact that Dan Cox is likely to lose, the Gathering Cox campaign is going to encourage extremist groups to agitate more. As we reported in a June episode, Carroll County Public Schools has now banned pride flags from schools under pressure from extremist groups. In non-education news, last week saw a controversy over streeteries that Montgomery County had allowed during the pandemic. Streetery is a roadway close to vehicular traffic and used as an outdoor congregation space by communities and as outdoor seating for nearby restaurants. During the pandemic, when streets were not in use that much and outdoor spaces in greater demand as communities tried to stay distant and yet congregate, Montgomery County allowed four streeteries two in Bethesda, and one each in Wheaton and Silver Spring. The city of Rockville had its own separate streetery as well. With pandemic safety regulations now easing, even if infection rates remain high in certain places, Montgomery County Department of Transportation, MCDOT, which manages the county's streets, announced that they will be reopening one of the closed roadways in Bethesda and the only one in Silver Spring, called Newell Street, back to traffic. Over the last two years, streetery or open street advocates have campaigned to keep these spaces closed off to traffic. Streeteries have also seen some opposition, as drivers have had to go around the closures. And in the case of Newell Street in Silver Spring, there have been a few residents in a nearby building who have complained about the noise, the alcohol, and other inconveniences. Who does public policy serve is a perennial question in politics. But the County Department of Transportation, however, decided to fix the problem in classic government goof-up style. Expecting pushback, they first sought to share the blame by announcing that the Planning and Parks Department's were involved in the decision. The planning department said no, they were not. Then MCDOT said that they did a survey of residents and arrived at their decision that way, but were not able to produce any evidence of any survey. The latest position they have taken is that they are responding to complaints from nearby residents. Unclear 
how many residents complained, and whether those complaints were weighed against the numbers of community members who have come out in support for keeping streets close to cars. Meanwhile, the battle between those for and against the Newell Street streetery continues on Twitter. You're listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I'll be back with Casey Anderson and Eli Glazer of the Montgomery County Planning Department. Across the years. They're calling across the ocean. Yeah, they're calling across the land. And they will till we all come to understand. None of us are free. None of us are free. None of us are free if one of us is chained. None of us are free. There are people still in darkness. Yeah, they just can't see the light. If you don't say it's wrong, then that says it's right. Casey Anderson, Eli Glazer, welcome to I Hit Politics. It's great to be here, Sunil. Uh, happy to be with you and Casey today. You are the author of a um, pedestrian study uh, in Montgomery County, Eli, and you have this report. You know, how many of our pedestrians are actually school going children? I don't think we know off, off, just based on the data that we have. Uh, we worked with MCPS. We did a student travel tally that ended up surveying over 70,000 students in Montgomery County Public Schools pre-COVID, um, essentially asking folks how they got to school and how they departed from school. Um, and uh, I think we found some pretty interesting things. There actually is a difference between people walking to school and people walking from school. In a lot of cases, parents or siblings are dropping kids off at school, but dismissal is at a time where you kind of have to fend for yourself. So what we found across the board from kindergarten to 12th grade is that people, students walked home from school at each school at higher rates than they walked to school. And what we also found across the board is that uh, there was more walking at the elementary school level than there was walking at the middle school level than there was walking at the high school level. And that we didn't have like a concrete, like cause and effect, but I think there are a number of sort of inferences you can make. One, elementary schools, students tend to be closer to the elementary school that they attend. Um, they have, um, elementary schools tend to be located in more walkable locations within the community. Um, people, students walking to middle or high school may have to walk further distances. They may have to cross roads that either the, public school system or their parents feel are not suitable for them to cross, uh, which leads to more people taking the school bus or um, it being driven. And then what we also found at the high school level was that um, as more students, as you get older, uh, either you get a driver's license, your friends get a driver's license, we see walking going down and non-family car commuting going up. So you're getting picked up by a friend on the way to school or home from school. So sort of carpooling in that way goes up. But I think also public transit use goes up as well at the high school level. So uh, there's some fairly robust public transit um, mode share at the high school level, particularly obviously in places that have better public transit access, like Bethesda Chevy Chase, uh, sort of Wheaton High School. Um, I think one of the goals of this plan and the reason we did this data collection effort was to really understand at a base level how much student walking is happening with the goal of increasing that amount through uh, building new infrastructure, uh, creating programming, and improving enforcement around sort of traffic safety so parents feel more comfortable having their kids walk. MCPS is a strong partner in encouraging walking reducing uh, driving trips to and from school and reducing school bus usage. Uh, so thinking about ways we can work with MCPS to invest in capital improvements in the short term. So um, does it make sense really to build a better crossing of Georgia Avenue, for instance, in Aspen Hill uh, in the short term, which may be a large expense, 
but will it save 20 round trip bus trips a day for the next 40 years, right? Like that's the trade-off that we're thinking about here. Casey, do you, can you speak to the relationship in the design process and how the planning board and the planning department influences or shapes um, the design decisions that MCPS makes? Yeah, we certainly try to influence those decisions, but as a government agency, they're not obligated to follow our advice, even though they're obligated to consult with us through a process that's called mandatory referral, uh, which is a statutory obligation of government uh, projects to uh, submit their plans for comment by the planning board and the planning staff. And where schools are concerned, the board and the staff have consistently pressed MCPS to uh, bring the buildings to the street, not put the parking in front of the building. That's what Eli was uh, you know, touching on just, just now. Uh, building sidewalks on, the, on all the frontages of the uh, property, which you, know, you have some school properties that never had sidewalks built around them. So when the school is, is uh, renovated or an addition is built, there's an opportunity to, to build sidewalks where, the, where none were originally um, constructed. I would say that uh, it's been a struggle, honestly, to get MCPS uh, on board. Part of that is about money, uh, because like many property owners we deal with uh, in private development, uh, especially uh, projects that are not uh, large scale, uh, you know, multifamily or large commercial projects, there's a reluctance to spend money to put in sidewalks. Uh, and, and sometimes the attitude is, well, you know, that's really putting a burden on uh, the school system to pay for sidewalks, which are going to benefit, you know, the entire community over in the neighborhood. So why shouldn't the Department of Transportation or some other government uh, body be responsible for funding and, and constructing those pedestrian pieces. Speak to that a little bit. They have limited budgets. Uh, MCPS does. And so they're like, don't burden us with it. It's your responsibility. You, you, you know, the Department of Transportation or whatever else, Department of Sidewalks, you do it. Why is that not a viable option? The money that we do have, that we do get in the capital budget for sidewalks and for these improvements is... I'm not sure it's in the hundreds of thousands. I think it's a little bit more than that. But this, the demand uh, for facilities is far far outstrips the ability of the county to provide those facilities in the short term and in the medium term, frankly. Um, and then I would say on the school piece, I think we've heard loud and clear through the mandatory referral process that uh, the chair is referring to that um, MCPS feels like they don't have the money to build these improvements. And one of the recommendations in the plan is uh, now that the bicycle master plan has been adopted, now that the guidelines from our complete streets design guide uh, relating to sidewalks and dimensions of streets and things like that are out there, um, these frontage improvements that provide connectivity to the school and sort of regional connectivity for people walking and biking, there's no reason they shouldn't be scoped as part of the initial design phase of these projects so that they can be included in the budget considerations for um, the county's capital budget. When you're retrofitting a school, when you're building a new building, so much of the cost of these pedestrian projects is just mobilizing. It's just getting the construction equipment to where it needs to be that time. And when you're building a school, you're building sidewalks already. You're just building internal sidewalks. So the extent to which we can just mobilize what's already being used to construct things along the frontage. It just makes a lot of sense from an efficiency perspective, and um, it would help improve the quality of our pedestrian network. Right. So have you given some thought to this idea that you mentioned before, that do you want to save bus trips twenty for 20 years uh, and make the capital investment up front? I mean, how do you show that in a credible, persuasive way? Well, I, I think that the fact that we used to have walkable communities until very recently, and we don't anymore, proves, as I said, that there's nothing inevitable about the idea that everybody's going to drive their kids to school. And I think 
it's also telling about just the general sort of windshield perspective that we have in our society that the attitude is, well, sidewalks are extra and somebody else ought to pay for them. I've never heard anybody suggest that they, that the Department of Transportation should have to build the driveways or the bus loops on the school site. So the assumption is, well, infrastructure for cars and school buses is, of course, necessary and required. Infrastructure for walking and bicycling is is elective. We haven't done that yet. I think we continue to have our conversations with MCPS and the transportation folks over there. I think what I would say is that, um, I mean, to use an example that we're both familiar with, Aspen Hill, Harmony Hills Elementary, there's a, the majority of students who attend Harmony Hills live east of Georgia on Hewitt Avenue, and they get bused across Georgia Avenue a distance of about a quarter mile because that intersection and walking along Georgia has been deemed unsafe, right? So what I think what can be done and what should be done is there are opportunities like that. If we can improve that crossing, that corridor, Hewitt at Georgia, and then up to um, one of the access roads into that like Harmony Hills community. If we can improve that to the satisfaction of MCPS transportation from a safety perspective, all of those buses that serve that incredibly short, incredibly sort of walkable trip, uh, they go away. There's the sort of cultural issue of, I think, a Department of Transportation at MCPS that... um, I think historically has viewed itself as a busing department. Um, and I, I think that has worked for a long time uh, for them. But I think as a county, we're, we're well aware of the benefits of walkability from a safety perspective, economic, equity, public health, et cetera, independence for children, et cetera. And um, I think what we're trying to do in the planning department is help facilitate a shift in that agency and in all the other agencies that deal with the pedestrian experience towards a more sort of multimodal, a more walkable experience. So seeing, understanding that school busing will always have a place in the transportation formula for MCPS, but there are opportunities to invest in these specific spot improvements that will offset many, many, many years of school bus trips and have all of these other add-on benefits for students in terms of independence and um, public health. Right, so you are describing hazard busing. Were you able to quantify the degree of hazard busing in MCPS? There's the MCPS walk zone of the area where students have to walk, which is like the larger area for elementary schools. It's a mile uh, of network distance. But then within that, there's the actual zone where students can walk and they don't qualify for this busing program. So what we essentially looked at is um, the difference between essentially how many residential dwelling units between in this larger area mm-hmm. were could access the school comfortably, which was a proxy for not have to cross at an unsafe location or walk along a dangerous road. Um, compared to um, all of the residential dwelling units in that area. So if there was a high percentage, like if 90%, for instance, of residential dwelling units within that larger area um, could access the school comfortably, I think we can assume there's probably not hazard busing happening there. But if you look at other schools where Harmony Hills is a good example, um, all of the Hewitt Avenue residential units cannot comfortably access Harmony Hills. So the percentage of comfortable access is really low. So what there's probably, um, I think it's probably like 9%, like 18% or something, because if you look at it on a map, right? Like the area bounded by Matthew Henson, Connecticut and Georgia, like looks pretty big and that's where Harmony Hills is, but it's all single family houses. Right. And Hewitt Avenue is a very dense, corridor of multifamily housing. So, and that's where a lot of the majority of the school children for Harmony Hills live. So um, I think if you look at the existing conditions report, um, each school has a map and data that sort of shows the comfortable access percentage. 
which I think can be seen really as a proxy for um, the likelihood that hazard busing does exist. You know, we talked about this earlier, but 16% walk back, but 12% walk to schools, right? And so are they walking back in a so I think I imagine it's a time concern at that time, you know, in the morning time concern rather than sort of safety concern. The 4% differential that we see, right, they are, in fact, walking back. So it is safe for them to do, right? They've determined. Yeah, I don't we didn't ask if they felt safe or not doing the walking, but somewhere along the line, their parents felt comfortable allowing them to do that. Or I think in a lot of cases, this based on some of the school sites we're talking about um, that may be in equity focus areas. So areas of sort of uh, lower income um, and things like that. There may not be other options necessarily. Um, Like you're not, like if there was the same situation in a different part of the county, maybe you would get somebody to pick you up or something. But walking in a lot of parts of Montgomery County for children is really the only option because um, your parents are at work. Things are things are outside of sort of your control, and that's what you you end up doing. So, I think there are some people, just like the general pedestrian population, there are some students who walk for by choice uh, because it's the comfortable thing to do. But there are some students that walk because they don't have any other options, um, and they may be walking in more com- more uncomfortable conditions. You know what is also striking to me is that. There are walkers and there are a handful of bikers and almost no skaters. I mean, we really don't like skating, right? And we have no parking way to, to, you know, if we bring the skates into school, that's like not okay. Yeah, I think that was an interesting sort of piece of this as well, that like those other modes like skateboarding, skating is not, I think scootering actually is having a resurgence based just anecdotally. But um, yeah, it's been interesting that, it's mostly walking other than school bus and getting dropped off by your parents. It's mostly walking and then a little bit of biking and public transit. Yeah. And our middle school here, I mean, my son sometimes used to bike, but you know, that was like, you know, they had to have two or three bikes on the uh, bike uh, in the bike rack and in the elementary school, maybe six or seven at most. I mean, it's hard to, uh, it's really not the case that, uh, the kids are using wheels. Yeah. And I think part of that, um, my colleague, David Ansbacher, uh, was the project manager for the bicycle master plan. And part of that plan and some of the recommendations focused around improving the quality of bicycle parking at MCPS schools. Um, And I think a lot of the designs of the limited bike parking that does exist is really, um, I would say, not standard, not best practices, bike parking from a security perspective, both in terms of like how the racks are designed and where they're located on the site. So I think that's that's part of it. I mean, you want to have a comfortable place to lock your bike that's protected ideally from the elements, that's secure, that has eyes on it. So it's not like behind a dumpster somewhere uh, and uh, is somewhere you feel comfortable bringing your bike to. Um, So I think there's that part of it. And then also, I mean, similar to the pedestrian situation, um, Montgomery County continues to build out the bicycle network. So it's comfortable for people who are of all ages from, we say from eight to 80, but really from five to eight, let's say. Um, But we're not there yet. So I think I understand why parents may not feel comfortable in a lot of Montgomery County, um, just having their kids bike to school um, independently. Yeah, and certainly we don't like skateboarders at all. So we talked a lot about Harmony Hills and the, how it needs immediate help. Um, are, what are the other schools that stand out for you uh, in terms of these actually need immediate help? I mean, like New Hampshire Estates, like right on, on New Hampshire Avenue, um, Eastern Middle School, Blair, um, these schools along some of our more major state highways. And I will say that MCDOT is working on um, a study of improving conditions along some of those schools in the University Boulevard. Everybody on the council supports student safety, walking to school, but there doesn't seem to be the possibility of, has not, at least in, in, in previously, the possibility of actually moving that train forward. You know, I'm so maybe Casey, you can uh, speak to that. 
Well, part of the point of this plan and by applying some more rigorous uh, quantitative methods to bike and pedestrian planning in this plan and the bike plan, we're trying to establish a basis for prioritization. And that I think is one of the major contributions of both of these plans. First, the bike plan and now the pedestrian plan is to give uh, people making decisions about uh, budget a basis for evaluating other than who's tugging on their sleep. Part of the uh, work that was done in this plan is a predictive safety analysis, for example, that attempts to uh, get ahead of uh, hazards by identifying what are the characteristics of places where there have been uh, collisions with pedestrians in the past and try to figure out where are there similar conditions so we can do something about it before somebody gets hit. And I think the, the plan is designed to help focus the limited resources in the places where it's most likely to do the most good in terms of reducing traffic deaths, uh, but also improving the livability of communities and getting the best bang for the buck in terms of improving conditions. Because, I mean, as I always say, it's not just about not getting run over by a car. That's extremely important. But even if you never get run over by a car because you never try to walk around your own neighborhood or walk to school or walk to the grocery store and instead you decide to drive yourself, that represents a cost to you. That's an erosion of your quality of life. You're deprived of the opportunity to live in a neighborhood where you can walk around. That is a huge cost that's hard to quantify, but it's real. And it goes to the issue of whether or not we have communities that are that are livable and desirable and support the high quality of quality of life. So this plan is designed to drive us towards a situation where that we can maximize the number of people who can live places where it's not only safe, but attractive and appealing and hopefully even irresistible to walk around, to bike around, to, to take transit by walking to the bus stop or taking a bicycle to the, to the metro station. Those things are building blocks of what make uh, communities healthy in every sense of the word, socially, economically, the kind of places that people want to live. But do you think it's working? Well, I would say the bicycle plan is working better than I ever could have expected, that it lays out tiers of priorities for specific projects, specific segments of, of roads where bike facilities are needed. And we've seen that some of the advocacy groups like WABA have used the bike plan to identify projects uh, to advocate during the budget process, during the capital budget. And just this last cycle, WABA succeeded in getting some of the tier one bike improvements in the equity focus areas funded that were not originally going to be included in the budget. And I would, I hope and expect this pedestrian plan is going to have the same kind of results. And while it's not going to transform the entire county overnight, you can already see in Silver Spring, there are now protected bike lanes. There are, there's bike infrastructure in Bethesda. And now that's creating a virtuous cycle as people in Wheaton are complaining that they haven't gotten the same attention for bike facilities that Silver Spring and Bethesda have received. So we're creating a dynamic where we've identified places that a limited amount of resources can be invested and have an impact. And that in turn is creating demand for walking and biking. And it's creating a political constituency for more resources to be directed at fixing these problems, even in the places that are not the, at, the, at the top of the list. The county that we have today, the county where uh, the majority of students get bused or driven to school, like this is a product of choices that we've made over decades and decades and decades. And this plan, this pedestrian plan and the bicycle master plan are, I think evidence that there is uh, the beginnings of an opportunity to address those sort of historic inequities and historic um, sort of 
misapportionment of our resources as a county uh, in a more walkable, bikeable direction. So I think it's definitely frustrating um, pointing at different situations in the county that like obviously shouldn't be that way, but were due to decisions that were made in the past. But um, I think this plan and implementing this plan are really going to be like the work of the rest of my career probably and then some here because it took decades to get here. All of these retrofits, all these things that we're talking about to change the physical environment are way more expensive now than they were in 1960, in 1950, um, but they're really important. So I think what this plan does is lay out what needs to happen at a policy level, at a really high level, changing operating procedures, changing priorities, changing designs of different things moving forward. Um, and then I would imagine um, a lot of what's in this plan, there's like some pretty exciting recommendations in here to push back uh, on, like for instance, to uh, work over time to assume county control of state roads in our downtowns and town centers like assume more responsibility for these roads to get to allow us to reimagine them and re-envision them in ways that are walkable that aren't just about moving cars as quickly as possible between our neighbor through our neighborhoods but to create like truly walkable places so like there's high level stuff there's very technical things but um taken as a whole these recommendations are about imagining and working towards that future, which is going to take decades and decades to achieve. But um, I think there's support for this um, in the planning department, at the planning board, at from our elected officials, and from DOT too, frankly. There's a lot of support for the ideas in here um, at the agencies that will ultimately be responsible for implementing them. But um, as I think we're all aware, like these bureaucracies are a big ship and we're very slowly turning them in this more multimodal direction. But once we sort of get on that, on that footing, on that heading, we, we're going to be in really great shape. Eli Glazer, Casey Anderson, thank you for coming on I Hit Politics. I'll be watching closely. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Sunil. Yes, my daddy was a miner. I'm gonna be a sunshiner My granddaddy was a miner I'm gonna be a sunshiner Ever since they closed the mine Ain't too much to do Wash your clothes in the crick and fold the flannel Till the gal come along with that solar panel What lessons can we draw from my conversation with Eli Glazer and Casey Anderson of Montgomery County Planning? First, just 12% of MCPS students walk to school, though 16% walk back from school. That 4% difference is an issue of working parents being unable to pick up their children in the middle of the work day. We didn't even talk about the number of children who remain at school in after-school programs because they simply cannot be picked up or walk home. Interesting but not surprising is that elementary school students walk more than secondary school students. The walk sheds for elementary schools are tighter. High schools feed a larger area with more large roadways and greater distances that make walking less feasible. By high school, many students are driving themselves and others are carpooling with the drivers. Second, most students across the board take the school bus to and from school. This is the suburban school model that Casey Anderson and Eli Glazer would like to see changed. But this call to change is hardly a small one. What Anderson and Glazer are arguing for is a rethinking 
of school itself, school siting, school design, the surrounding and connecting infrastructure, and even what students do. Casey Anderson says that MCPS uses school designs that are replicable rather than site-specific. One way this manifests is over football fields, which can be emotional and often viewed as an equity issue. The question is this, does every MCPS high school need to have a football field, or for that matter, a football team? In down-county urban areas, a site-specific school could abandon the large football field for a different set of academic, sporting, and infrastructure choices. But it will require a sea change in public attitudes for that to happen. Third, as with the difficulty of bringing about this change, the rewards of change can also be great. Hazard busing, the idea that children are bused sometimes and their commutes take longer than it would if they walked, is a sad commentary on society itself. Because we cannot make our streets safe for pedestrians. These students have to take buses. Of course, hazard busing affects communities in the poorer parts of the county more. For example, along Georgia Avenue, which is one of the worst corridors for pedestrian safety in the county. It is also true for schools like Candlewood Elementary, which has only gotten sidewalks after years of advocacy, and Burtonsville Elementary, which is still struggling for safe routes to school. A school bus does seem like a service in those circumstances, but what if we didn't even need it? I'd like to see school bike racks full and some parking situation for skateboards. I'd like to hear the boisterousness of children walking home after a day in school. That's all for this episode. You've been listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. Music for this episode comes from Montgomery County climate band, The Sunshiners. Kippen Martin on guitar and vocals, Rick Sullivan on vocals and guitar, and Jeffrey Wisner on the double bass. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at ihppod. I hope you'll subscribe and share the podcast as we bring you stories about politics close to you and to your home. Truth. See you next week. Time is coming. We know it's close at hand Our mother, she is pleading I've had all I can stand Rivers of oil, blood and tears Darkest evil And their friends, this web of lies, they defend truth. Time is coming. We know it's close at hand. Our mother, she is pleading. I've had all I Their own dark warnings they would not heed. They took the money, they chose the greed. They pumped that oil into the skies. They filled our heads with their lies. The truth, time is coming. No, it's close at hand.